All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Questions for Jeff Live, episode five. This is the first time I've done this live, the Questions for Jeff series at least, uh, but I think it should be fun. I've got a lot of questions from Instagram, and uh, if you guys who are watching live have any questions, you can feel free to chat those in as well. So I'll wait a couple minutes for people to join. What's going on, what's going on? Roy Blackbeard, welcome, welcome. Again, this is Questions for Jeff Live, taking live questions as well as a slew of questions from Instagram. So should be really fun, interesting, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some queries. Okay, well, the questions are coming in. Uh, let's wait a couple more minutes, maybe not even that. Just wanna welcome everyone to the show. I'm currently in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And uh, where are you guys coming from? Chris from England is here. Williams from India. We got Ben, I think, from France, or Benny from France. Eric from Edmonton. All right, so we're all over the place. Trey from Greenville, South Carolina. All right, great. Ah, we got some Brooklyn in the house. We got some Portugal, love Portugal. Don from Virginia. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so I'll wait uh, two minutes in. So we got 40 more seconds before we jump into the questions. Again, this is Questions for Jeff Live. Oh, I got some really epic light on my face now coming through the window. Overexposed. Okay, so this should be interesting. If I go like this, eh, whatever. We'll be well lit for this one. Hey, Ben from North Dakota. Ah, oh, welcome everyone. Matias from Argentina. Josh from LA. All right, well, we got 10 more seconds before we jump right into the questions. And I'm going to kick it off from Instagram. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to write them in. Um, and I will try to get to as many as I can today and hopefully offer some quality answers. So the first question is from Dylan Sapienza. How does someone play outside and come back into the key smoothly? Great question. What Dylan is referring to here is playing outside of the chord changes. So, you know, you can play inside the chord changes, playing notes that kind of exist within the chord at hand or the scale at hand. And then you can play outside of that set of notes. So it does sound a little bit like more of a rub, a little bit more tension there, but that can be a really cool effect. The trick is how do you go outside the chord or uh, the chord progression or scale and then come back in smoothly? So that's that's what Dylan is asking here. And it's a great question, something that I have uh, thought a lot about, especially when I was in school. I was wondering, well, how do you play outside and, and make it sound good and, and smoothly go outside and then come back in? And I find that the, the best way to do this, it's not even the transition outside and transition back to inside that is really the, the trick. It's just how do you sound good playing outside? And I think the answer to that is also the answer about coming back in smoothly. So my go-to uh, approach for that is to play with context, meaning whatever it is that you play that's outside the progression, it needs to be, uh, it needs to have good structure to it, good context, meaning, um, you know, there are different approaches to playing outside, like using the pentatonic scale or the tri or triads that don't necessarily relate directly to the chord at hand. And the reason that these approaches work so well is because the triads and the pentatonic scales have a lot of structure to them. These are really strong intervals. Um, you know, you can play a melody in the pentatonic scale. It's going to sound great because so many, especially folk melodies, are using that scale, that pentatonic scale. If you don't know what the pentatonic scale is, it's five notes um, for major. It's the one, the two, the three, the five, and the six of the major scale. And then there's another one for minor. Um, we don't have to get into that right now, but the point here is that the pentatonic scale is so solid in terms of creating melodies that when you do go outside of the scale using the pentatonic scale, for instance, let's say you're in the key of C major, you're playing Twinkle Twinkle Star in C major, and then you go to play the F sharp major pentatonic scale. All those notes are gonna be really wacky in the key of C major, right? But because the F sharp pentatonic scale is made up of a set of notes that can create such powerful, strong melodies, you can get away with just about anything. Now, when uh, you have to go back inside the chord progression, one great way to do that is to mirror or build off of whatever you just played in the other outside key. So if you play, um, let's say you play something like one, two, three, one, like F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, F sharp. Uh, then you could play that same phrase in the key of C, C, D, E, C. Now there's no sort of pivot note or anything there that's gonna get you smoothly from F sharp to C, but what I'm saying here is that the context, the structure of that strong phrase put in both the key of F sharp and then C is gonna create enough 
overall context to make it sound good. Hopefully that makes sense. I know that was kind of a long answer, but it's a uh, it's a big question, and you know there's more to it than that. But I'll leave it there for now. And um, now I'm going to take a question from from uh, YouTube here. So why not on a tripod? Why am I shaking like crazy? I'll try to keep it steady, or even better, maybe I'll just put it right here. Sorry about that. I know I'm moving my hands a bunch. Maybe I can lower the shade a little bit too, so I don't have the sun coming in my face. Hang on, I'm gonna come back to you guys in a second. Okay, there we go. A little bit better light. Okay, and now the, the camera will be steady. Great, okay, so we're coming in here with some questions on the tube. I'm gonna scroll back a little bit. For everybody that was writing, I'm just gonna kind of pick one at random here that I like. Um, so, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, uh, Roy Ziv Music is asking, how did you get your first big gig, like working, writing music for big companies? So for those of you that don't know, I do write uh, music for advertising, television, film, that sort of thing, documentaries. And I've been fortunate enough to work with some pretty cool brands. And if you're interested in that, you can check out my website, jeffschneidermusic.com. Uh, but Roy's question is asking, how did I get the first job there? What, what was sort of the... Um, the first big one that kind of was a catalyst for more to follow. Um, and I would say the first gigs that I got for writing, I was basically interning for a producer, not even there to specifically write music, just to kind of help out around the, uh, the production office. And when there was a job that came around that required some original music, I had the opportunity there to step in. So, you know, I was there doing work, just like office work, not even music related. You know, this is many years ago, but being in that position and that space allowed me to then step in and write music when it was needed. Now, when that music was needed, it's not like I was getting paid, you know, a huge amount for that specific music, but that's not what it's about at that point, right? When you're just starting out, you need to build a portfolio. You need to get some of those big names under your belt so that when you do go to look for other work, you have some sort of work to show for yourself. So uh, that's how I started. It was working with a, a producer directly, just doing some office work, and then was uh, able to do some, some uh, composing when the need uh, arose. All right, so I'm going to take another question here from Louis J. Barry. This is on Instagram. The question is, why, why do you need to think of music as a business? Um, well, Louis, I don't think you need to think of music as a business, but it depends. If you're trying to make a living doing it, then yes, it, it does become more of a business in that regard. Uh, if you're just doing it as a hobby, then you don't need to think of it as a business. But if you're trying to make a living doing it, then obviously, yes, then it's more important. Um, so I guess that's the short answer. The long answer is, and I'll try to keep the long answer short too. Uh, the long answer is that when you are trying to make a living doing music, you have to approach it just as any other entrepreneur would. So you can't just, you know, hope for the best, you know, you have to have some sort of a, a plan or at least some goals and uh, an approach and a way of getting from point A to point B to point C. And I think the best way to do that is to look to uh, entrepreneurs or business owners who are not in the music space, because unfortunately, not a lot of musicians or even people in the creative fields are very good business people. So it can be really helpful to look to folks who are not necessarily creatives and kind of I mean, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of people who are creative who are also great business owners and uh, entrepreneurs, but um, it's certainly, and unfortunately, the minority, I think. So um, look to other spaces, even in the creative space. Like if you're in music, you know, look to people who are running photography businesses or, or production businesses, anything along those lines, and, and see how they're doing it. And then you can learn from that because the principles of business are the same across industries. It's, you know, you have to sell yourself, you have to market yourself, you have to, you know, be in touch with your following, yada, yada, yada. Point is, approach it like any other business. Okay, so uh, let's, get, let's take another question here from, oh, I've got a, uh, a baby and a wife here making an entrance. I'm going to take a question from YouTube. Should I hold this kid? Sure. All right. Oh, I think there was a question in here about how the little guy was doing, so, so cute. he's doing great. <laughs> For everyone who doesn't know, this is Harrison. He is a big fan of 
Uh, Charlie Parker. Two. Right, Harrison? And Glenn Gould. And Glenn Gould. All right. He's very white right now. Sorry about that. There we go. Yeah. All right. Let's see if I can do this. Oop. Hang on. Crazy, crazy. Harrison, you have any answers for people? Why is it so bright, man? Oh, my goodness. Still super bright. <laughs> no, it's just like maybe you can close this window for me. That might help. I just I, I want him to be in his you know his best form here. He's just ah oh, look at that cute face. Better? There we go. Thank you. Yep. All right. So oh you don't have to close all of them. <laughs> Harrison's answering questions now. If anybody has any uh, hard ones, he's up for the challenge. Okay, buddy. Let's take a question from YouTube. Oops. Um, uh, uh, uh. Okay. Um, okay. Jan Freites asks, how do you analyze the chord progression of giant steps or countdown? Um, whenever you're analyzing any chord progression, I think the first thing is to look for the main key centers. So in countdown or giant steps, you know, that's moving in usually in three key centers. So sorry, we're shaking here. Okay. Let's put this down. So look for the, the main key centers first and then look to how you get to those key centers. So for instance, in giant steps, you start off with a B major chord and then you go to a D7. <laughs> All right. If anybody's finding this boring, at least you can look at Harrison and, you know, enjoy that cuteness. Okay, so anyway, um, as I was saying, giant steps, B major to D7, and then you go to G major. So the first key that you look at is the B major. Then you have to look at the G major, and then you can look at the chord that connects the two. So I'm not going to get too into it because it's a very specific question, um, but that's where you start whenever you're analyzing anything. I like to look at the main key centers and then look at the cadences for how you get to those key centers. This is, this is going to work for giant steps and you know for all the things you are, for any tune out there. Right, Harrison? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, another question here from Instagram. Uh, okay, Angelo Zabian asks, do you have any suggestions on how to incorporate the Locrian mode into improvisation? Whenever I try to incorporate the mode, I have trouble achieving any form of melodic harmony. Um, by the way, sometimes I don't save these live streams after the fact. This one's going to stay on the channel. So um, anyway, I don't, let's continue here. So the Locrian mode, look, whenever you're looking at scales like the Locrian mode, which are more unusual than say the Ionian mode, which is the major scale, what, what, regardless of the scale, you have to be going by what sounds good. So what I would recommend is practice singing the scale and then practice writing melodies or singing melodies with that scale. There's, there's, there shouldn't be so much of a distinction. <laughs> Somebody finds my answer super interesting. Uh, there shouldn't be so much of a distinction between improvising and composing, right? It's Improvising is just spontaneous composition. So you should approach it as similarly as you can. Meaning, don't think about creating these really fancy lines, just write melodies. So if you're working with a new scale or a new technique harmonically, oh, this is gonna dissolve soon. Don't worry about the, um, don't worry about whether it's like super hip or not. Just try to write a good melody using the Locrian mode, for instance. That's, uh, that's a great place to start. Okay. Oh, okay. all right. Uh, let's go this way. Okay, we'll do a little bit of this. Nope, this is not gonna work either. <laughs> Ow, he's done. You had enough? Oh, thank you very much. Okay, cameo from Harrison is over. But that was a good one. All right, um... Let's get a question here from, from uh, YouTube. Okay. Nuno Gabriel asks, how do you maintain your creative mind focused? Have you ever been demotivated? Cute baby, by the way. Thank you so much. He's, he is cute. Um, a couple questions there. In, ter in terms of cre uh, keeping my creative mind focused, um, I'm not entirely sure what you're getting at, but what it sounds like to me is, well, first of all, staying focused and staying creative can somewhat be 
those, those two things can be related, especially when it comes to like practicing, because when you're practicing, you want to be focused, but also be creative. Practicing shouldn't be like super boring ever. I mean, if it is, that means it's probably not challenging enough. Um, so what I, what I mean by this is whenever you're working on writing something or practicing something, put limitations on yourself. So, you know, maybe that means you're only practicing a certain set of intervals or a certain kind of rhythm, you know, starting in a certain part of the measure. Infinite examples here. The point being that if you have these very strict, limited restrictions that you put on whatever it is you're writing or, or practicing, you'll be able to then stay super focused because you have sort of these parameters and it won't be as easy to just kind of wander off, you know, into some other territory. It's very similar to meditation. When you're meditating, you just focus on the breath, nothing else. So that, you know, if you do wander, you'll become aware of it. The problem is when you don't have a focus or some sort of predetermined approach, it's really easy to, to wander in terms of your mind. So set that up ahead of time so that when you go to write something or practice something, it's very clear when you're you know, focusing on something or when you've, got to, when you've become distracted and moved on to something else. Then you can bring yourself back to the task at hand. Uh, the same thing goes for creative, being creative. When you, are, when you put limitations on yourself, you're forced to become more creative uh, because you're not allowed to put limitations on yourself and just be like, oh, this is boring because I'm not allowed to play anything above you know, G or above, you know, uh, between the three and the six or whatever the parameters are, you still have to make it musical and interesting. It's just more challenging that way. And it forces you to be more creative. Hope that, hopefully that makes sense and that helps. I'm going to take another question from Instagram. Uh, Toby Harry Saunders asked, do you play any other saxophones like baritone, soprano? If so, any preference? Um, you know, I play soprano, alto, and tenor for the most part. Really haven't done too much baritone. These days, as you most, most of you know, I just play alto. Um... I don't know if I have a preference. I mean, I kind of, I used to switch back and forth like every couple of years, alto and tenor. They both have very different personalities in my opinion. Soprano is a really difficult instrument to play well. So in order to have a good sound there, I feel like you really have to keep it up and practice a lot. And um, these days I pretty much just have enough time to keep the alto uh, up and running. Okay, YouTube. Um, okay, Gianluca asks... I'd like to learn jazz, soul, and R&B harmony and come up with good progressions, but I'm not very good at theory. Do you have any courses online or on Udemy? Udemy? Um, no, but the more accurate answer is not yet. I am coming out soon with a video course that's going to be all about chord progressions, sort of going to be a two-part thing. The first part's going to be more uh, voicing focus, like how to play voicings for different kinds of chords. I'm going to do it on piano, but you could apply it to arranging or guitar or any chordal instrument. Um, and then the second part of the, uh, the course is going to be based on um, building progressions and the theory of building progressions. So I think that will answer a lot of questions and it's going to be, uh, you know, I do offer a lot of this information, as you know, on YouTube, uh, but it's not always in, you know, the best sequence, especially if you're a beginner, you need sort of something that's more of a step one, two, three, four, five. So this course that I'm developing will be more uh, along those lines, a very... Uh, logically sequential and, and so forth. Um, by the way, um, Gianluca, thank you for the, uh, I believe that was a super chat donation there. So thank you so much for that. I uh, appreciate it. If anybody else um, is interested, there is the super chat function on uh, YouTube live stream where you're able to do a little uh, donation if you choose um, and, and post a question along with that. And it, it does pop up on my feed here. So it's easier for me to answer. Okay. Um, I'm going to take, I'm kind of going back and forth here between uh, Instagram questions and YouTube. So let me do a quick Instagram here. Um, okay, Andy asks, how do, you be, uh, how do you beat performance nerves? Like how not to shake, control your breath, etc. cetera. Uh, best answer I have for this is experience. The more you do it, the better you're going to be at it. Uh, you have to practice in the practice room. You know, all the scales, arpeggios, learning tunes, transposing, all that stuff. But you also have to practice performing. It's it's definitely part of the game. So you, you just got to get, get out in front of people and, and, and do it. That's, you know, it's sometimes you're going to fall on your face. It's okay. Um, but the more you get comfortable playing in front of people, the better you're going to be at it. Simple as that. Okay, back to the tube. Um, thank you, Jerome, for the donation. I appreciate it. Um...
All right, Eli asks, hey Jeff, I feel as though I have a basic misunderstanding of meter. For example, what's the difference in feel between 6.4 and 6.8, 7.4, 7.8? Uh, I know this is a simple, but I'd love an answer. Um, okay, so basically the number on top is how many beats you have per measure, and the number on the bottom is the note value for which gets one of those that gets one of those beats. So if you're in the in the time signature of six eight, you have six beats per measure, and the eight underneath the six is um, equals an eighth note. Sometimes, and I don't think anybody does this, but I've heard about this before, where people will write time signatures with the number on top and then the actual image of or the the graphic of the note on the bottom. So you'll have like a number six, and then you'll draw an eighth note underneath the uh, the fraction there, which makes a lot of sense. But the eight does represent an eighth note. So that means you have six eighth notes in each measure. The number on top is how many beats in the measure. The number on the bottom is what kind of note gets one of those beats that is on top. All right, all right, all right, all right. Any tips for altissimo from Nicole Powers? Uh, yeah, practice your overtones. Overtones are the key to altissimo. You also have to learn the fingerings that work best for your instrument. Uh, by the way, altissimo, for all you non-saxophone players out there, it means very high uh, in Italian. Just notes that go beyond the standard fingering. But you have to work on your overtones, and you have to find fingerings that do speak well on your instrument. And there are multiple fingerings for different notes, so it's just a matter of trying them out. Also, once you do get it sort of a handle on playing those altissimo notes, it can be really helpful to practice etudes and transcribe solos or anything up an octave so that you're forced to go in that range. All right, um, let's see. I'm gonna take a question from Instagram again. Trevor Jones asks, any tips for sharing marketing self-produced music, ways to actually get people to hear it? Uh, great question, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's, there's no one answer for this kind of question. Um, obviously the first thing is to just put it out there as much as possible, put it out there on Instagram, put it out there on YouTube, put it out there on an email list, put it out there on your Facebook page. Um, you, you know, it, it, give people flash drives. I mean, it, there's there's any number of ways to get people to hear your music. Um, another thing that's kind of obvious is it has to be good. If it's good, people will share it. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of it. It's uh, it's it's a matter of being persistent. And and uh, con can and consistent, persistent and consistent, consistently put stuff out there and be persistent about getting getting people uh, to listen. All right, here we go on the YouTube. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. I'm just looking through some questions here on YouTube. Again, this is questions for Jeff live. This is episode five. Thanks everybody for watching. This is the first live edition of this show. Hopefully uh, you guys are enjoying it. It is going to be on my YouTube channel after we're, we're done here. We're gonna go for um, another seven minutes or so. Okay. Um, Eli Friedman asks, how do you effectively utilize rhythm in a melody? Great question. Rhythm is one of the most important things in, in music. It's more important than the pitches, in my opinion. Uh, I think phrasing and rhythm are sort of at the top, and then pitches do follow after that. So in order to get good with rhythm, I think just like uh, with anything else, it can be really helpful to imitate the kinds of rhythms that you like. So listen to the music that you like, copy the rhythms, and incorporate them into your own music, and internalize them. And then eventually, they'll kind of come out naturally in your music. I know it's sort of a you know, short answer there, but that's basically how it works. When you wanna learn anything, you copy it, you make it your own, and then eventually it does come out naturally. I know it's hard to believe, sometimes it can take a few months, but uh, whether you're practicing some super advanced harmonic uh, or you know pattern or rhythmic device, the more you do it, it takes a couple of months, but whether you're improvising or composing, you'll find that it shows up without you having to try. It's something to do with, you know, you first have to get it in your short-term memory and then something happens back there, you get a good night's sleep or something and suddenly it goes into your long-term memory and uh, that can take some time, but it is worth it and you just kind of have to be patient and wait for that to happen. You know, I, even guys like, uh, you know, I heard an interview with Michael Brecker once, uh, you know, the late Michael Brecker, 
one of the most uh, amazing tenor saxophonists ever, one of the most in influential tenor saxophonists ever. Um, he talked about how some of the stuff that he would work on wouldn't come up, wouldn't come out in his playing for five or six months, if not more. So you got to be patient there, but it will happen. Hey, William, thanks for the donation. Um, something for guitarists, please. Big Neo Soul and Gospel Chord Voicing Strategies. Well, in terms of voicings, um, I think the the key there is, you know, I do play a little bit. Of, first of all, I do play a little bit of guitar. Um, I don't practice enough to be super proficient, but, you know, I, I can kind of play when I really do it slow and hash it out for the same four measures for like an hour. I'm not sure if I have any like specific tricks for voicings. I mean, there are great voicings out there for R&B music, obviously. I think the, the, real, the real deal comes down to the, the little inflections that you play. Um, you know, I don't really know who started this, but you know, it's that sort of that Jimi Hendrix sound where you're doing a lot of hammer-ons with the pentatonic scale. Uh, but you know, I'm sure even before Jimi Hendrix guys were doing this stuff, um, it's, it's not just the voicings, but it's the little, the little um, tasty inflections that go into those voicings little hammer-ons here and there, um, even just the way you give that little, that the neck a little bit of a shake to get a bit of a vibrato in the chord. I know it's not the best answer in the world, but there are really great um, guitar YouTube channels out there in terms of coming up with different voicings. Of course, the chord progressions that you play are also important. So, you know, you can take a chord progression from a, an R&B or a new soul tune that you like and just play, try to play that on the guitar and um, find some voicings that you think lead uh, nicely from one chord to the next. Because it's not always about the voicings in particular, but it's how, how one voicing leads to the next, which is called, of course, voice leading. Very important. Okay. Um, if anybody has any uh, advice for, for um, or resources for good guitar voicings for um, neo-soul, R&B, and gospel music, feel free to leave them in the chat here. For, uh, for our friends. Um, okay. Yeah. The glass is empty, unfortunately. That's the last bit of water. Good thing, because we only have three minutes left. All right, I'm going to abandon Instagram for a little bit and just stick with the uh, YouTube here. Um, okay. Mr. Silver Mo asks, hey Jeff, sometimes when I play sax, I can hear my spittle going through the reed in the mouthpiece and this makes an odd sound. Any, uh, any, in general, there is much water in my sax after playing. Okay, so um, I don't know if it's water, might be a little spit, that's okay. You can say it's condensation, that's what I always say. The worst thing is, uh, you know, you got your sax on your leg, you're done practicing, you're going out to buy some bread and then you realize all your spit has uh, emptied out onto your pants and you have to stick around for 30 minutes. I took that story from Will Vincent, sorry Will. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, anything that will help with that, you turn your saxophone over before you put it down on your leg, empty it out onto the carpet, better than the floor, less slippery. Sorry, this is getting gross. Uh, and then as far as the spittle sound, you gotta suck that stuff out. It came out of your mouth. You can put it back in. Oh, boy. All right, we got about one minute left. Thank you all for your questions. Really appreciate you joining me. Um, let's see if I can get one more question in today. Um, Gianluca, jumping in here. Thank you for the donation. Your videos are a good start, starting point for jazz soul R&B beginner with a casual order. To, do I have any books or tips to learn the basics of this genre? You know, I unfortunately don't. I can recommend the jazz piano book by Mark Levine or Levine. Uh, it's not specifically for R&B or soul, but you know it is a really good book for learning jazz uh, voicings, and then you can of course transfer those over to R&B and soul music. Um, you know, all the stuff that I play, I've learned from my buddies and from transcribing and from YouTube videos. So the stuff is out there, just hard to find. Again, I'm working on a course right now that will answer a lot of those questions. It's not gonna be specifically dedicated to soul or any kind of music for that matter, but look, soul, R&B, jazz, the harmony is all the same. Um, so that course will help. Okay, that's it guys, 30 minutes is up. 
I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Questions for Jeff. This was the first live episode. If you did like it, please let me know in the comments. Um, and well, uh, it's certainly much easier for me to do this than edit a whole video. So we'll, uh, you know, if you guys are enjoying it live, then I'll do it again next week and we'll, uh, continue the series that way. Um, going forward, as, as I said, I am taking questions from Instagram. Basically I post on Instagram and ask for comments, uh, that include questions. So look out for my Instagram post. If you're not following me on Instagram, my handle or username, whatever it's called is at Jeff Schneider music. And on Twitter, it is Jay Schneid's music. I got to change that at some, at some point, but that's what it is. J-S-C-H-N-E-I-D-S -S music. Okay, that'll be all, guys. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Questions for Jeff. <laughs>